Hello, good morning and welcome to the Atomic Fridge Radio Show, the show where we tackle science and maths behind the silly. I'm Toby and joining me today as always are my co-hosts Andrew and Joe. Hi. And um, this is the episode titled The Tessellating Kaplunk. Our guest today is jo- uh, Sean Dewar. Hey, great to be here. Um, so I'll explain the format a little bit. Um, last week's episode was our pilot and we were quite pleased, we think it went quite well, didn't we? So. Um, the thing is, the issue with the first week was we didn't really get a chance to introduce ourselves, so we thought we'd spend the time today to introduce ourselves and also have our, our guest on to interview him. So um, I'll pass you over to my co-hosts now, Andrew and Joe, who have a few questions for Sean. So I'd first like to say I'm Andrew, I study maths, and this week we'll be getting to know our en- know your enemy, basically. I don't know what Joe has to say about this. Uh, well, that's, that's generally because I'm what's considered a uh, filthy natural scientist. Uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't decide on physics or maths, so I did both. So for those of you that don't know, Joe is neither good at maths or physics. So I'm, I'm, okay, I'm okay at both. I don't know, Toby, you're, you're a theoretical physicist, so I don't know what you think about this. Um, yeah, I, I do theoretical physics and maths, so I'm, I'm a bit indecisive between both. Um, I'm probably not that great at either, but, you know, it's how it is. <laughs> so for those of you that don't sh- know Sean, I'm going to just give him a chance to introduce himself now. Hey, uh, I'm uh, Sean Dewar. I'm a PhD at the department teaching, uh, well, a PhD in maths. I also teach maths. That's how I know Andy. Um, I also, uh, my area is in uh, geometric rigidity theory and looking at crystal structures. Uh, mainly in non-Euclidean spaces. Um, so that's me. Um, done there. So I think the first, probably most important question to ask is why did you study math and why did you choose to do a PhD in maths? Um, I'll be honest, when it came to stuff to study, when I was about 15, I realised I was pretty much rubbish at every other subject apart from <laughs> mathematics, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, so much like all of us. Yes, <laughs> frankly. Maths, maths made sense. It was, it was very easy to do. I always always had an interest in it. Um, yeah. And the further on I got in life, the more I realised that definitely maths was for me. Um, why I did a PhD, uh, apart from the reason I want to hide from the real world for a bit longer, um, is that I did, um, when I looked into doing a PhD, just out of interest, um, I saw the area of geometry rigidity theory and I talked to Derek Kitson who's my supervisor um, teaches real analysis shout out to you um, and uh, talked to him about the area and it was very I was very interested immediately um, and um, yeah I've been doing it ever since so so would it be fair to say that you don't think maths has any real world applications you want to stay away from those for now <laughs> I think most of my office would say maths have <laughs> the maths they do has uh, no real world applications and they're very happy about that so um, okay so you're not going <laughs> to run away now and realize that oh my god i could have done real maths <laughs> no i'm not um my area is actually very applied um we recently went to there was recently a talk on a monday about some guy who's uh, doing formation control of robots and drones and it uses a uh, rigidity theory um so it was the idea of um, drones wanting to be a set distance away from different drones. Do the drones like go into a formation together or not? And this uses rigidity theory. Uh, it was a very interesting talk. So some of it is applied. Um, NASA uh, a few years ago made something called tensegrity robots, which were robots made of just bars and cables with a little camera like holding in the middle. And the idea was that if you ever go to Mars, these things are really bouncy and springy, so you can just carpet bomb an area with these things, about 50 of them. They're really cheap, NASA cheap to make. So uh, about 10 million <laughs> Yeah, about 10 million per robot. Uh, <laughs> and, the kind um, of money I would just yeah. spend on a cup of coffee. Yeah, 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 yeah obviously. <laughs> and then um, by just stretching and... Um, so by stretching and shrinking the cables, they could force it to walk. Um, and it was thought of in a, like a cheaper idea of doing than uh, a parachuting a drone in. So there was, that is an application of rigidity theory right there. So, so there you go, guys. Sometimes <laughs> really weird maths does have good uses. Yes, exactly. So, so you're saying that your PhD is completely motivated by, your, by you having an interest in your subject and not at all by the fact that you just want to call yourself doctor. <laughs> so, there's no part of you that wants I wouldn't to be doctor. <laughs> so so you're, you just want to be doctor? doctor? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a doctor, don't you know? Don't I mean, you know? Being Dr. Dewar, I guess, will give me like some leverage at like Christmas dinner and stuff like that. So, I, I have the impression <laughs> I, I have the impression from Sean that he's the kind of person that when there's a problem in a restaurant, someone says, Is there a doctor here? He's gonna go, Yeah, I'm a doctor. Well, or nearly. 
I'm a, I'm a maths doctor. It's no use right now, but I thought you should all know I'm a doctor. I worked really hard for my degree. Be proud of me. And it also gives uh, Sean's mum a chance to go, my son, the doctor. And I she feel, is. She is most certainly going to be doing yeah, that. Um, yeah. She has told me already that is her plan. So. Oh, okay, right. so it probably brings us on quite well to the next question, which what, when you obviously, we know why you were motivated to do your PhD, but what do you think changed the most for when you went from an undergraduate student to being a postgrad student? Um... One of the things, it sounds a bit ridiculous, but just the amount you learn. Um, once you start doing postgrad, you realise how, in some ways, it's not slow, but it's, it's done at a different pace. Once you, the more maths you know, the faster it is to learn other maths, because you have more different, it's more like you have different angles of looking at it. So you end up just like, I learned more in my first year of my PhD than I did in four years of undergrad. And you just do so much reading and just, just you just immerse yourself in mathematics and you just learn so much. So, so the you, speed of it was kind of surprising. So you wouldn't say it's a nine to six kind of job. You'd say it's a 24 <laughs> seven math, eat, live. You do actually maths. have to learn how to turn it off. Um, it sounds stupid, but um, like going to sleep and having a problem <laughs> stuck in your mind, you have to realize that you can't just think about the problem because you won't sleep. <laughs> you have to just like turn it off and go, no, I have to not do this. I have to, and you have to set bounds for yourself. But saying that still most of the time if i'm getting the bus in i've got a problem i'm working on in my head i'm thinking about something it might not be relevant to what i'm doing but i'll just set myself a random problem and i'll have a look at it do you so. think that all math lectures around the country and all professors and all phd students have the ability to switch off or do you think some people genuinely are 24 7 yeah when you you see both sides you see the person who can come in and do nine to five go home hang out with their family and they've got that sorted and then you see the people who come in and they'll do like 12 hour days and that is that is insane and <laughs> but it, but they are like very productive um so it it depends on the person um so yeah you do see both sides of it you yeah so i'll bring us on because you obviously already given some advice there for <laughs> uh, the future phd students among among the listeners so the three of us um <laughs> possibly what advice would you give to someone that's just like not even started their undergrad degree so maybe uh, last year of a levels or just about to come to university what about a seven-year-old a seven-year-old i mean we can start apparently we're going to start at the age of <laughs> yeah. seven yeah build it up uh for a seven-year-old i guess like just problem solving because th- Unfortunately, the maths that you get taught, at, I mean, all three of you must see this as well. The maths you get taught at GCSE is not like the maths you get taught mm. later on. Yes, definitely. It's um, very much geared towards um, people who want to be accountants and stuff like that, which is fine. I mean, like, that's that's okay. But um, maths is problem solving. Um, so just doing all, like, little, little logical puzzles, they're the best prep you can ever have for a proper degree in uh, mathematics, I would, I would have thought. So you'd just say this applies on all levels all the way up to your undergrad. And then before you arrive, I mean, one of the things we were advised to do was do quite a lot of reading around the subject. Like, that's quite heavily pushed as an idea. Now, do you yeah. think that's a good idea? or just... I, now looking back, think that is a good idea. I, however, didn't do it at the time and uh, regretted it. Uh, but I did start doing the reading once I started doing my degree. And it, it does help. It, it's just stuff like, um, if you don't get something, don't just be happy with not getting it go out and figure out why you don't get it. That, that is the best advice I can give because I know a lot of people who are just willing to go, oh, well, as long as I can do it on the exam, I'll be fine. If you don't have a fundamental understanding of it, it does, it really doesn't help. It, like, you can't, the better you understand something, the more you can um, uh, look at it from different angles and work it out in your own way. Um, so. Having Having just... Still, having gone through the British education system, I'm assuming, I mean, you might have been French or something. <laughs> British education British system, education yeah. system. Very, well, just continuously for the past, basically the entirety of your life so far. Uh, do you think that um, it's kind of the maths, as you said, the maths at GCC is kind of geared away from maths mm. as, as a subject, as a study of mathematics. Do you think that it would be better if it was more geared towards that, or do you think that would put more people off? Um, I think it would... I think it would help because a lot of people think maths is just boring trigonomic, uh, trigonometric equations and just plugging stuff into our calculator and getting answers. And that is totally not what it is. And the amount of people who just say, are like, oh, I'm really bad with numbers. Well, I know mathematicians who are bad with numbers, but it doesn't matter. I mean, I don't really use a number higher than like 10 anymore. Uh, <laughs> it's all algebra. So, um, I, yeah, it, it's the sort of thing of... I think it would make it more interesting. I am a mathematician, though, so I think I am probably quite biased. So, 
Um, anyway, <laughs> but yeah, I think it would help to do it more a pure mathematics way. So I'm probably the only person in this room that's done this, but when I did GCSE, we had like further maths GCSE and we had stats GCSE. So we had like quite a lot of different <laughs> maths options for GCSE. And I thought that really helped actually, because everyone did obviously have to do basic maths, mm. which everyone did the one that you're on about, but I got the opportunity to try analysis size of things. I got to try calculus before I went to A-level. I got to try statistics, so I did things like Poisson distributions. But okay. I did all this at GCSE level. Do you think it would be better to roll that out across the board so people got to see more areas of mathematics like they get to an A-level in their degree? Yes. Um, I would think that was actually that sounds really good. Um, the I will say, however, it has to be done right because I did a stats... I have a stats GCSE. Um, what happened was we did our maths a year early um and we did it in year nine and year 10 because i was in the higher set of my school and then um we did stats afterwards um but the stats was kind of just a dosh year it wasn't really taken seriously um so i mean i, I did all the coursework within a week i think and the exam was well uh too easy frankly <laughs> it was a bit of a joke um and it wasn't done it wasn't taken very seriously if it was taken seriously i think it would be very very good okay well thank you i'm going to go back to an issue well not an issue something we talked about slightly earlier mm -hmm. in you talked about the sense of you need to switch your brain off for when you're not doing your phd and you need to give yourself that which you need to sleep or yeah have free time so what i'm wondering about now is in your free time in this time where you're not doing math <laughs> what do you like to do um <laughs> anyone who knows me knows that i am uh, partial to a drink um i do like i do like having a good session in the pub so i do like going uh, doing that um it's, it's, it's good to just keep you socially centered so you know i mean like don't just hold yourself up in a room and just do mathematics i mean that'll give you the tortured artist look but it won't um be very good for you mentally obviously um so i do like that um i'm a big reader i love reading um so uh, i've unfortunately slowed down recently but um i usually get through quite a few books in a year usually at least one a month now but usually it was going on like one a week if not more so just to be clear here we're not just talking mathematical reading here we're talking outside the subject this is outside the subject. Yeah, yeah. yeah yeah um i do mathematical reading as well um but mathematical reading is like it is is different because you have to work out the stuff so it might be like i'll be talking to my co-workers and be like i've read five pages of a paper and that'll be impressive but <laughs> if you say i've read five pages of a book um that's not so impressive um Films, I like films. Uh, big fan, of, big fan of the movies. I watch a lot of them. And I think it annoys my mates to no end when I quote movies all the time that they've never seen. So I'm uh, just going to ask now for the interest, for the interested audience. Obviously, do you like Indiana Jones as a series? <laughs> I can see where this is going. Uh, I like, I, I like one, two, and three. So the I'll Kingdom of the far. Crystal School to you, the 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 scene with the fridge, no particular like to that. Um, it wasn't it wasn't my flavor. Uh, <laughs> it, it wasn't <laughs> it wasn't really my thing. Uh, yeah, no. I mean, Indiana Jones with load of like centuries old Templars and stuff trying to flog your dodgy cups is fine, but uh, aliens is just too far. So that's my opinion. Okay, you you heard it from Sean first. <laughs> no aliens in Indiana Jones. He doesn't Keep want aliens. aliens. Out. He doesn't want aliens in his, in, his, in his Indiana Jones films. And that brings us on aliens quite nicely to a, a new topic of films. What do you think of the three Star Wars movies that exist? Uh, <laughs> Joe um, has happily forgotten which... about the other movies. <laughs> <laughs> the three the three that exist, possibly four, depending on, where the, on, on Rogue One, because some people quite liked that, some people didn't. You're referring to the prequels, yeah? <laughs> I mean, personally, my favourite character in Star Wars is Jar Jar Binks. I don't know how the rest of the group feel about this. <laughs> I'm hoping you're joking, because I'm walking out otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my favourite character possibly is probably Yoda, because he reminds me of myself after I've had a drink. can't speak <laughs> any words in the right order, for instance. Walks, walks, around, walks around with a little walking stick, even though he doesn't need it. Uh, can apparently jump three or four times his height and that's do back that's, that's only in his head though <laughs> yeah, obviously so um i should ask sean because you've just said that you have a few other interests and obviously maths is probably quite a large part of your life and you've already said actually that maths is the only thing you thought you were good at at a younger age so 
What do you think you would have gone into other than a full time alcoholic <laughs> if, if, you, if you hadn't gone into mathematics? Uh, I have thought about this, and I think the answer is just bizarrely film studies. I, I think it was the only other subject that really interested me because I really do like my movies. But I am rubbish at writing essays, so I don't think I would have done very well at it, but I would have enjoyed doing it, I guess. So, so you think you made subject. a good choice? I think I made a good okay, choice. That, that's good. Nothing against film studies people, by the way. Um, <laughs> much but Sean wouldn't it, have been very good at it. I would have been terrible. So <laughs> the world's better off without me as a movie reviewer. <laughs> so Mark Commode can be safe for one more yeah. day. <laughs> so obviously, once you've got your doctorate, I am. I, I hope you get your doctorate anyway. I don't want to jinx it for you there. <laughs> Touch words. But obviously, after you've got your doctorate, which you'll be coming to the end relatively soon, uh, year and a half, relatively oh, soon. Yeah. <laughs> relatively <laughs> soon. I mean, I mean, how long? How long has it been since you started? Uh, Not the doctorate. I mean, just university. Oh god, um, <laughs> this came out recently. Actually, when I was um, I was teaching some engineering students, and uh, one Why? of them on the first because <laughs> I get paid to, uh, <laughs> 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 uh, and one of them uh, asked, just being genuinely serious. Uh, so, are you like? what like a third or fourth year or something and i had to say no actually i'm a seventh year and um he looked absolutely horrified uh, right, <laughs> and i felt very old so one, <laughs> half, like, one and a half is less is a uh, less than seven there's some real real maths for you so for those of you in the Shout audience out to Big Shack. <laughs> <laughs> so for those of you listening right now it can be confirmed that sean is probably as old as your parents <laughs> sean Ouch. doesn't Ouch. sean is never going to leave university this is this is it for him he's going to become a lecturer here afterwards <laughs> shout out to several lecturers quite, and quite, quite, quite here. i may see the spine finished or is that too political i mean no one's gonna see the spine <laughs> yeah <laughs> so um so this does kind of nicely bring me into we've kind of just discussed that you're staying here forever but what do you actually want to do after you finish your PhD? other than stay here forever um hopefully um working in um become a postdoc at a university and hopefully uh, move into full-time doing my area um, would be very nice. Um, I do enjoy it um, a lot. There's, there's difficulties in academia, um, and it is only getting harder. But um, in some ways, my area is not too bad because it has some practical applications. They are more willing to fund it in some ways. So I probably have it easier in that way than a lot of other people. Um, I... It, yeah, it, it's a hard area to go into, but I'm hoping to go into it. Um, if not, um, I'm guessing industry and stuff. I mean, before I started doing a PhD, uh, I am now allowed to say it legally, uh, but I was looking at working for MI5, um, which you're not allowed to talk about when you do the job application. Um, and they have to vet you for, I think... It was nine months, but I think it's six months now. It is possible, guys, that the show could end abruptly now. So if we do... <laughs> is that on the door? If we do, I'm sorry, Why this are you is wearing goodbye. a balaclava? <laughs> <laughs> oh, hello, <chaps>. <laughs> <laughs> um, Yeah, no, um, I, yeah, I didn't go through the application fully. Um, uh, so now I'm allowed to speak about it legally. Is so. it possibly because they thought that you would spill secrets because you're... Ever so slightly a blabbermouth that you just said this live on radio. True. Uh, there's also the thing of uh, you watch a lot of spy movies, and I'm always thinking like I'm that guy that they just get to a bar and take to a bar and get him drunk, and he just tells them everything, like about the like the nuclear codes and stuff. And it's like probably a good <laughs> thing that I'm not in MI5. <laughs> so. Is it possible that you'd be the character that turn up dead at the start of every Bond movie? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, probably. <laughs> so, um, if we could go back to the maths department for a moment. Obviously, you've had a chance to, because you did your undergrad here, didn't you? You did your mm -hmm. undergrad here, yeah. and you did your master's degree here, yep. and you've done your PhD here. So there's Proper a bit of a, theme, <laughs> bit of a theme going on here. So you've obviously had a lot of time to get to know a lot of the other PhD students, lecturers, professors, and all the postdocs, actually, for that matter. So now getting to know them, who do you think in the math department you're most like? Oh, um... <laughs> Obviously, you can't say yourself. <laughs> uh, someone actually pointed that out in the office. Uh, uh, Chris Menes uh, pointed out that I could just say, as a mathematician, I am trivially most like myself. Um, but that, yeah, since that's not this. allowed, yeah, yeah. since that's not allowed, uh, I don't know. Um, Non-trivial answer. Me and me and Chris Menes share quite a lot of hobbies, so I guess probably him. He does also like a drink, and he does also like his films. So, guys, you also shout heard out to Chris. Here, you also heard it here that the maths department actually talk about our show on a regular <laughs> basis now. It has been said. This is what success feels like. Just, I should probably shout out that right. 
I should probably say right now that we do have a YouTube channel. It's called The Atomic Fridge. We currently mm. have a whole seven, maybe six subscribers. It's doing pretty <laughs> well. Numbers. So obviously we're not, and now as we're famous, yeah. I think you should <laughs> join on now just before it gets a bit um, too big. Remember, please remember to uh, like, just uh, shameless plugging here. Please remember to like our Facebook page, please. <laughs> Sean won't actually be allowed to leave until this is done. Yeah. Don't that, that say that. Might, we're, talk, we're, talk, we're talking to you. At the minute, you're the only one that can hear us. <laughs> okay, so, yeah. so, so now, apparently, we're going to go into a slightly peculiar game that Joe has invented, which is... I don't know how this came up last night, but oh, wait, we were wait, trying wait. to brainstorm ideas, and apparently... Our new theme of the week is we're going to try and get Sean to sing, rap, or make up a melody about his favourite mathematical theorem or physics. It's not. It's not theorem. quite that. It's not quite that. What it is is imagine you're at a farm, okay? Okay. And on this farm, you don't have animals. You have mathematical mathematical principles, mathematical theorems, ideas. It's a farm of ideas, okay? How would the old McDonald's song go? <laughs> So, for instance, we thought we could Jesus. begin it as um, Mark McDonald had, had a, a theorem. <laughs> E-I-E-I-O. <laughs> so, so uh, would you care to complete it? Um, <laughs> I am really bad at <laughs> this sort of thing. Um, <laughs> I have zero creativity. i got like an E at art at GCSE, so this is going to go interesting. So um, you can send this to your art teacher and say, look, I've got better. <laughs> <laughs> I think she just cried. You, you um, I think it'd break her heart. She's like, "Oh God, I taught this guy, <laughs> and he can't sing or do anything creative." Uh, so what was it? Uh, uh, old? <laughs> no, Mark McDonald had a uh, had a farm had a or theorem, a theorem. Had a theorem. Had a theorem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in this theorem, he had <laughs> hopefully no fallacies. E I E I O. <laughs> there we go. Okay. There we are. There we go, guys. So hopefully, hopefully Mark McDonald will be proud of you. Yeah. We're going to keep this going week on week, guys. We're going to choose different nursery rhymes every week. So you guys can actually comment, tell us, and share with us ones that you want to hear. And at the end of the series, we're going to vote for who was the best. Oh, dear. Well, I think I've lost. Nursery rhyme mathematician <laughs> singing. Yet another reason to uh, like the Atomic Fridge on Facebook. And if you listen uh, closely, you can hear all of our guests dropping out right now. <laughs> <laughs> we are down to one view, and it's actually me on the computer. Yeah, yeah, sorry about that, boys. Something I, wanted, something I wanted to ask about the maths department is in a lot of people who aren't in academia have this idea that every department in academia is constantly at each other's throats. <laughs> now, the maths department is, con as, you, as you get higher up, it kind of consists of a maths and a statistics kind of yep, melded together. Definitely. Is there a massive amount of rivalry between those two, or do they get on really well? Surprisingly not. Um, I mean, we both sides of the aisle make jokes about each other. Um, I mean, like, we're always going about, like, oh, you know. Well, no, I won't say any of the jokes. Statisticians are lovely. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, no, um, the... Uh, no, it, it was surprisingly quite chill. I've heard problems in other departments, which I'm not going to name. Um, but the maths and stats department actually gets along, as far as I can tell, very well. So that's quite nice. Do you, like, mostly regiment, obviously, because you'll be within your own group and you're within your own people mm -hmm. who are stood in your thing. Do you spend a lot of time with each other? Are you very, this is the analysis, guys, this is the algebra, guy, or are you quite No, we're quite free? we're quite mixed, which is um, very good. Um, we have... Um, a uh, postgraduate forum for the PhDs, uh, Mondays 3 p.m. I think <laughs> Gareth would want me to advertise it, um, but you get to see the other mass PhDs talk about their areas, and um, it's always good just to get like a nice knowledge of what else is going on in different areas of mathematics. And most of the time, like it, it's not going to apply to you, but like when it does, it's very interesting. And sometimes it's just very interesting stuff. Um, so no, we don't. We do mix quite a lot, um, which is very good. So which is very good because I think there's only two of us in rigidity, so it'd be very lonely if we <laughs> if it was just me and them. I mean, especially seeing <laughs> if the other person had to spend time with you all the time. <laughs> yeah, true. I think I think it would drive her crazy. So, <laughs> but fortunately for her sake, she gets to mix with other people. <laughs> so um, we're now probably going to move on to the more 
ridiculous side of our show. More lighthearted. The more lighthearted. <laughs> okay, we're going to go with lighthearted. The rap after, is after serious. The seri- after the serious conversation <laughs> we just had. The, the rap is a very serious part of the show, I think you'll find. Like, mm. oh, okay, I'm okay. not sure. There's actually going to be a prize that. at the end that consists of absolutely nothing for the person who did the best song. Oh, no, I'm going to write them a theorem on a piece of paper which says, you are the best rapper. Oh, proof, be proof. proof. And then just a link to the show. Yeah. <laughs> just out. We're going we're gonna to plug ourselves any way we can. Yeah. Um, so I should just say that Sean mentioned earlier another PhD student called Gareth Case, who unfortunately couldn't be with us this week, but will be joining us at some point. So now we're going to move on to a question, which is the, what the show is named after this week, the Tesla Tinker Plunk. And I'm going to let Joe try and explain this a little bit better. So I'm assuming, I'm assuming you didn't have like a, just a terrible childhood. No, I did not. Good, that's good. <laughs> so do you, do you know a game called Kaplunk? I do know the game Kaplunk. You know, you know the game called Kaplunk. So the question is, imagine you were playing Kaplunk, but you got a bit bored with playing normal Kaplunk. Mm-hmm. So you decided to remove that little ball that you put all the rods through. Okay. And you replaced it with a shape which has finite volume, but an infinite surface area, made of a material that you can pierce with the rods, and okay. it maintains its uh, rigid structure. Okay. Right. The question is, how many rods can you put into it? Is it depe- does, the, does the volume limit the number of rods you can put through it? And if so, is there still infinite surface area, even when you've penetrated all the possible rods in it? Ah, uh, right. No. And then how would dropping a ball work? I think in some ways, firstly, you've got to think about, um, we have to talk about the rods. Uh, that's a sensible thing to talk they about. They are standard, uh, standard internationally recognized Kaplunk Kaplunk rods. <laughs> Plastic. Kaplunk. So are, they are... are they normally green as well? I they, feel like. it, the color, um, the color, the I colors get multicolor as well. are as, uh, as necessary for feel... the international international Kaplunk championships. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, that's just... Which I hope is a thing. It's just for me then, apparently, because I I was deprived as a child and was only given green. Only, only, only allowed green. Oh, right? Oh, yeah. green. 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 <laughs> Our game was apparently harder because before we got it, my dad clearly removed all the other colours and he only gave us a few rods. <laughs> Expert level Kaplunk. Um, so I, so the, I'm going to assume they're finite length. And they're going to have some width to them. So we're not doing like the mathematical version of a stick where it's got like no. It's going to have some width to they, it. Okay. They, have, they, have, they have an unspecified Kaplunk okay. volume, <laughs> which, which we must look up on the uh, official international Kaplunk website. I'd like to say and, it's uh, we are not sponsored by the We are not constant. sponsored by Kaplunk ah, in right. any Actually, way, shape, say, or form. If we talk we about just a random like game, game. <laughs> if we talk about a random game, that could be described exactly like Kaplunk, but we're not going to call it Kaplunk <laughs> because for the that, sake of this because, argument. you know, we're not advertising them. Don't buy that yet. Yeah. Well, don't, the games you know are what? available. The no, dodgy knockoff like Kaplunk. Kaplunk. Or maybe do buy it. I mean, now you've got one <laughs> of those going you. either way. It's completely up oh, to yeah. you. You know, don't buy Kaplunk. It doesn't have a, uh, fi- a, a shape with a infinite surface area and finite volume in it. So what's the point? I, I mean, I only play my games with mathematically yeah. impossible to realize shapes. Yeah, so. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, we talked about the rods now. We kind of have an understanding. That they have to have some width. Have to. They likely have to have some mass as well. Because yeah, okay. And then it, probably the next important thing to talk about will you be have to poke it through fully. Like has to come in and has to come out. Has to come in. Has yeah, to come out. Full. But the shape right. maintained. Like that doesn't disturb uh, the. Uh, okay. We're going to assume it, it goes was, through, but it can't. It doesn't cause the shape to collapse. And we're going to assume that the holes in... are pre-existing, so to speak. Yeah, so okay, yeah, yeah. And then probably the other thing to mention is that in this example, we probably need to talk about the marbles inside. Marbles, you don't, you don't drop that marble in until later. So first, we want to ask this, and then we're going to ask about how okay, we okay. play the game with the marble. Mm, okay, or we have a method. There is, so the the famous example for uh, a shape with. Um, uh, finite volume but infinite surface area is uh, the if you take the curve y equals 1 over x start at 1 or something like that um, and then um, you rotate it around this axis yeah. um, and I guess you're like this just infinite funnel that goes on forever yeah. um, and you're obviously going to have immediate problems with this um, why I was asking about the finite length is if I had infinite size Kaplunk sticks I could stick them all in the direction of the x axis mm-hmm. and I could definitely fill it with a finite amount of Kaplunk sticks. Right. Um, but if you take the problem and say they have to be finite sticks, then I would actually say it's probably not true because the only ways I can think about would be to take the Kaplunk sticks and stick them in sideways and I would need an infinite amount to do it. Mm. Um, so um, there's that problem. Um, Why do you put them in really, really fast, though? <laughs> really, really fast. <laughs> like, really quick. We're talking really like quick. really fast, like... 
like the right, flash okay. kind of fast like okay the I, kind of tv show that you imagine science doesn't make sense in anymore it, it would king of the ocean it would have to be the speed would have to be Shout out to Peter. infinite and th- that will be an issue immediately so i think it would be just genuinely impossible um even though the shape is also impossible um true but um Another version I was thinking of is you can kind of take this and do it sort of in... There's, I've mentally thought about it. I think it, I'd be fine saying it, but you can take like maybe a polar coordinate one and have it spiral it in. So it's like taking what I've just described, but having it so it spirals into the origin, something like that. Yeah. So it looks like um, just an infinite tuba or something like that. Now that would be compact, and I would say that you would only probably need a finite amount to stick into that. Right. Um, and that would also be something with finite volume, but infinite um, mm. surface area. So I think that will. So you could that, fill that one. I think you could fill that one. Yes. So what would happen when you drop the marble in the top? Oh, um, for that one, um, unless the marbles could eventually shrink, the two examples I've given, they would eventually bottleneck. Um, mm. So it wouldn't matter how many kaplunk things so you have. So essentially, you cheat in your game of kaplunk. I've cheated in my game of kaplunk. Um, think about it. What would else be? Um, the way I would think about it is, if I could have a... Okay, so if I have a path where the marble goes all the way down, I can think of that as the area that's covered is going to be like some sort of long snaking tube mm-hmm. all the way through. Now, that means this long snaking tube has to lie inside whatever I've described, so the marble can go down that path. But this tube uh, would have infinite volume. Mm-hmm. So that would mean my shape would contain an infinite amount of volume. So I think the answer is, if I want a plunk game where I want I can have it fall forever that is impossible um, it, it would have to have some sort of um, finite it would have to have infinite volume another possibility would be to say uh, well what happens if we let it have infinite volume then yeah you do end up with all these crazy kaplunk things now um, but I think that might be getting a bit too abstract <laughs> so so do you think you could win that game of kaplunk <laughs> do you think that your, your think mathematical grounding would give you an edge uh, <laughs> against like a four-year-old. Uh, no, unfortunately not. So um, you don't think you could, you could win against a four-year-old in that game? No, I don't okay. think I could win against a four-year-old in Plunk. Do you think you could <laughs> win <laughs> against a very, very smart monkey? <laughs> Depends on the monkey, I guess. <laughs> it's called Harold. He lives he lives in uh, Birmingham at the minute. He's he's currently got a handler called James. There you go. We we have described the monkey this is the to monkey. you. That this is, is the monkey. monkey we are talking about. The monkey oh, is right. two and a half years old. Mm. Is he like um, just like the sort of monkey that just like throws its own like feces at people in the zoo, or is it like one of those like Tetley's chimpanzees that like you know has some like it, you know ability did, he to did be audition. human? He did audition for a role on an unspecified TV advert <laughs> to do with something you drink which is warm and normally has leaves to do with it. Uh, okay. Often served with milk and sugar. Oh, okay. And the volume of the monkey is finite. <laughs> <laughs> the volume of the monkey is finite. Unfortunately, you didn't get this role due to his flinging feces at the uh, the interviewer. Yeah, I can imagine that could be a, that could be an issue. Um, right. Um, depends. I mean, if he flings the feces in the kaplunk thing, then I would probably not play and he would right. win. So, uh, <laughs> that would be my answer. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to think I could beat a monkey at kaplunk. Um, <laughs> No. Unless you're going to bring one into the live or studio right now, I don't think that <laughs> situation is so ever going to come up. Well, our <laughs> next guest is. <laughs> what have you brought in a kaplunky? A kaplunky. <laughs> Toby adding that was a terrible. brilliant <laughs> pun to the show, which has just made our listeners drop into the negative numbers. <laughs> a kaplunky. <laughs> anyway, no. <laughs> okay. I'll stick to not making jokes. Okay. <laughs> I'll stick to maths. So, <laughs> obviously, we we talked about Kaplunk. Is there is there any other game that you think your mathematical edge might help you win? Like, is there any game that you think having a mathematical background you might be better at than, say, a non-mathematician? You're not allowed ah, to pick, right. You're not allowed to pick like games that game, you're not say so. You're not allowed to pick chess because or, this is a game that is played kind of internationally. It has a big community following you have to pick children you have to pick specifically children's games marketed by a terrible little company that no one knows okay um actually, that's not true you're allowed to pick big children's games i think one uh well this one's more of an anecdote but they use there's a there's a theorem in um maths called the pigeonhole principle mm-hmm. and um it means that if you have say five boxes and you have six items and you have to put a bo- an item in each box one box has to contain two items shout out to 111 one, one there 
<laughs> Shout out to one one one. It's a very, students. it's a very basic principle. Actually, I think it's one one two. I believe it is. 1-1-2. Yeah. Oh, no. oh no! I teach this. So I'm anyway. so sorry, guys. <laughs> sorry, I, students who did one one one. We'll do one one two most likely. <laughs> so, uh, so guys, shout out to them. So I'm, so, I'm yes, sorry, okay. guys. If you if saved, you've done one 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 and haven't done one one two yet, you've got all this what Sean's talking about to look forward to. Plot spoilers are coming ahead. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. So um, it, it sounds very simple, but it's very important theory of maths. And um, when I heard about it, um, one of the examples he gave was to do with cards, and I can't remember exactly how he worded it, but it was something like um, you can't pick. Um, what would it be? It's counting the numbers. I think it's you can't pick 10 cards without four of them being of the same suit. Because yeah. at one point, you're going to fill each box. Uh, I mean, wouldn't you only need five is cards? Th- is it 13? I think it might be. It's one of the two. I can't remember. But anyway, um, I, heard about this th- I heard about this theorem, and I immediately went home, and I started it as a drinking game with my mates, where I would say you get... It's a drinking game where you have to drink every time you don't do it. And it, I said it was very hard. I've done probability. It's very unlikely. And uh, we would just sit there and I would just laugh at my mates as they constantly drank in this impossible game they could never <laughs> win. Um, so in that way, I created a mathematically impossible game. And when they found out, they were all very annoyed and they made me play on the bus about four times straight. Oh, so oh, wow. <laughs> they so were a bit annoyed. I don't know about any of the other mathematicians you share, but I, I used to play a game with non-mathematicians called Number Wang, which many of you have ever heard of. It's, it's a, a great very game complicated to play. game. Yes. It's a great uh, what you basically do I'm not going to reveal the whole thing but if you're a mathematician you probably only know how you play this with non-mathematicians completely frustrate them (laughs) then explain it and they get very angry at you yes because there's really no logic to the game yes there literally is no logic that's the whole point of that is number one (laughs) so guys that's number one you heard it here probably not first but you heard it here Um, so I think possibly we've talked about infinite kaplunk yes what happens if we had lots of games of Kaplunk at the same time? Say infinite we've got no, infinite, infinite number, number of number. games <laughs> with finite with finite players. Is this a uh, so Hilbert's infinite Kaplunk yes. problem? Hilbert, right. Hilbert's Kaplunk Hotel. Yes. So we initially so if everyone have was playing Kaplunk in that hotel. Ba- basically, what we imagine is in every room there's two people playing Kaplunk. Okay. And then twice the number of people arrive. <laughs> the number of people, all the people that are already in there. There's the same number of people arrive and all want to have games of Kaplunk. What do you do? <laughs> and they all want to have games of a kaplunk. Um, right, I, well, I, well, I guess you would just pair them up and tell them to go into rooms together to play kaplunk. So do you not think you'd double every room, every original room, make everyone move to the room that's double the room they're already in, and then add everyone into the N plus one room? So I mean, you had every room filled with a game of kaplunk, because it just, just doesn't sound like a very effective way to run a kaplunk they, tournament. Do they get to take their <laughs> game of kaplunk with them? <laughs> or do the new people have to come into oh. a half-played game? Or, or do the games automatically reset? Is it like Tag Team Kaplunk? <laughs> but then you would have no... Because there's an infinite amount of Kaplunk games, you would have no actual um, reason to be any good at Kaplunk mm. while you're playing. All you need to do is make sure that your Kaplunk stick doesn't go out. So strategy kind of goes out the window. Because you could just have to remove any old stick as long as it doesn't cause a complete collapse. You don't have to think strategically or anything because then immediately you just move to the next room and it's never going to be your problem ever again. So, <laughs> yeah, this is a bit it, mean. But, but you could make it the problem for everyone in a room after you. Yeah, you could, you could just be really horrible and like make sure there's like two sticks at the end balancing everything and there would be only two left. Uh, so the strategy could be ruin everyone else's game. It's, it's kind of like the prisoner dilemma, except there's no bad outcome for like really just <laughs> being horrible to other people. So, so it's a very immoral version of the prisoner's dilemma. <laughs> so basically, you're talking about the prisoner's dilemma, you're talking about the pigeonhole principle. What about infinite buckaroo? <laughs> infinite buckaroo. So you've got a, a, so you have, a so horse. So buckaroo, and it's got an infinite number of bags on it. Mm-hmm. Okay? So an infinite number of bags on it. So... How much does that hurt when that thing goes flying and it hits your little sister in the eye? <laughs> well, I guess uh, it, uh, one thing about this problem that you didn't have with the Kaplunk is with the Kaplunk you had like a, a like a uniform property. Mm. So the sticks are all the same and the marbles are all the same. I assumed. Um, yes. While with no, Bookaroo, really one one big one, one singular giant marble, giant marble that <laughs> you saw at a market one day and brought home and it's it like, got mixed in the set for yeah. no reason. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe maybe allowing some variation, but uh, there is some sort of uniformity. With Bookaroo, you have lots of different items. So it would be kind of like if you have one item that would be maybe like um, half a gram, and then the next item is a quarter of a gram. And then after that, you would say maybe um, uh, like an eighth, uh, a sixteenth, a thirty-tooth. 
the 64th, so on and so forth. Um, and it would converge, um, I think, to a half. Ooh, if I get this wrong, I think I'm going to get a lot of stick in the office. Um, but um, hoping. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I've got too much time to work out the geometric problem, uh, the, the, the geometric series for it. Um, and that would have a finite weight. Um, so if it flew off and hit your sister in the eye, it would only weigh like a finite amount. So hopefully it will be a finite amount that's not too painful when it hits you in the eye. Mm. If everything weighs infinite amount, you probably crush Bookaroo and <laughs> the planet. <laughs> so there'll be some negative sides. I mean, your sister would have more problems to deal with than getting a hat in the eye or something from Bookaroo. Next, next week we do actually have <laughs> a physicist on who we can ask that question for you. Ah, right. As to what would happen if you just put infinite mass on the Earth. Ah, this so is we'll, right. a, we'll ask that. We'll ask that for you. It reminds me of a book I read um, where the guy gets given silly problems and he solves them. Um, and it's one of them what was, if, isn't it? Yes. I think um, I, I think I I as a mathematician also got this book from it, a family really member for good. Christmas, which is I think where Sean's going to go with yes. this because if you ever tell your family you do maths, it, surprisingly you get a lot of maths books yes. for Christmas. Yes, you do. Um, I like at first it was a bit like daunting when uh, all my family are going like oh now you're a mathematician here have all the maths and it was like oh god there's so much but uh now I, I really enjoy it now um i do go back and reread them but anyway in this book it has um about what would you have if you had a mole of moles where a mole's uh, a number in physics mm -hmm. so the uh, in chemistry sorry um and so you can deal with uh I mean, a, chemistry atoms. And physics <laughs> at this point physics. you're getting close um it's the it's I a number it's a set number and it's ginormous yeah and they just wanted to see what happened if you had a mole of moles and uh it went through all the problems of gravitation uh gravity causing more to form a planet and having a frozen mole outside and a molten mole core and it was a quite interesting problem and he worked out the physics for it and it was quite cool very uh, disgusting as well but uh, quite cool <laughs> so yeah <laughs> oh, oh. I'm, just I'm just checking for the reader if anyone uh, I'm trying to work out what the exact amount of a mole is I think off the top of my head I can't see quite it is it 6.23 6.023 times 10 to the 23 yeah. 10 to the so just to explain how, how, how big this is there's like a lot of zeros after it. <laughs> like there's like 23. Imagine um, you take your hands. At least 23 right? big, and you big just zeros. Keep, keep stretching them out <laughs> until you get to the point where you think that's big enough. And then make it bigger, and that's how big it is. Um, me and my, me and a coworker were recently uh, just uh, just googling about the, um, what's called a Googleplex, mm -hmm. and um, there was quite a lot of interesting facts about that. Where it was um, like there's not even been even remotely close to a Googleplex amount of time, um, like amount of seconds, milliseconds, or any other type of seconds. Well, to a limit, obviously. To, um, to explain like this that. to the listeners, I should probably say, I think I'm right in saying this, and Sean can correct me if I'm wrong. Right. Googleplex is the biggest number that we can feasibly have that we know of. Is that about right? No, I mean, you can always oh, just we'll add a zero wrong. to it. So you can well, always... But it's the cheeky mathematician thing of like, how what's the biggest number you can think of? Oh, Googleplex. Well, I've thought of a Googleplex plus one. Um, <laughs> it's a very smart all, aleck nature of mathematics. Know, infinity plus one does exist. <laughs> yes, it does yeah, actually. Yeah. Uh, because it's so. just infinity. <laughs> uh, oh, ah, uh, depends. Is it not? Oh, oh. Oh, it depends on cardinality it. or um, there's um, uh, ordinals as well. So... You can have in a, you have all the counting numbers, and then you can have LF one, and then bigger. So it, it, the, there's quite a lot of in, uh, interesting videos on stuff about, online about. So it, you're probably best thinking of cardinality um, is the easier one, but there's bigger. Inf some infinities are bigger than others. So the I natural like numbers is be, very big, but the reals is much much bigger. So. I feel like you could be referencing a John Green book here called uh, The Fault in Our Stars, where they talk about how s some infinities are bigger than others. I think we found Sean's <laughs> true calling here in life. Does it really get mentioned that? Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> like, you don't know. like you don't know. <laughs> I don't watch the font. Of my... should, That's not should, my movie. We should probably say at this point the Atomic Fridge is educational as well as fun because <laughs> I'm learning quite a lot of new things even if you guys aren't. <laughs> uh, yes, I, I have a tendency to lecture sometimes. About it. <laughs> good, good yeah, job that you're in the right field true, for it. True, true. Yes, uh, I can uh, get paid to bore students for the rest of my life. It'd be so I, much fun. <laughs> I can vouch for this. I have been in one of Sean's tutor groups. <laughs> it's lots of me just complaining about my wages and yeah. <laughs> being a general despicable person. I guess so. <laughs> Who is your supervisor for your PhD? Ah, oh, is uh, Derek Kitson, uh, Doctor Derek Kitson. Do you think that upon listening to this? be proud of you 
<laughs> or do you think that you no longer do a PXT at Lancaster? Or do, you, or do you think that, you, yeah, you're no longer here? Uh, <laughs> well, I guess you'll find out next week. I guess. <laughs> yeah. So guys, no, tune um... in next week to find out if, <laughs> if, Sh- if Sean actually still goes to Lancaster. I'm hoping, if you're listening, Derek, that uh, you don't disown me mathematically. Uh, <laughs> Because uh, we have we have so much research to do together. Please don't leave me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so um, right. <laughs> so we're coming we're coming towards the end of our show now. We're in the last uh, five minutes or so. So I should make a few comments about the structure of the show from this point on. Obviously, we've now done a pilot and a, f- and a second episode, and we'd like to tell you some of the future guests we've got coming on, such as Mark McDonald. So oh, oh, we're Mark's gonna, coming. We're going to tell you up to week twelve. Because everything after that is a secret. <laughs> oh, okay. Definitely because it's a secret. Now, uh, week nine, week nine next week, we have booked in, I believe, uh, Professor or Doctor, I, can't, I cannot remember off the top of my head. He's definitely a doctor. We'll definitely go doctor. doctor. Uh, Konstantinos Dimopoulos yeah, in physics. Yes. I believe that's so how he's it's a... said. He's, I believe, cosmologist, but he'll probably come on and correct me. <laughs> it's all right. So we're, we're getting which, used to being corrected quite a lot by everyone that comes yeah. on. It's, it's, good, it's, good to be cor- it's good to be corrected. Everybody's learning. Uh, week <laughs> ten, we have Professor Anita Stefanoska, also from physics, who'll be coming on. She will be doing our Christmassy special. Oh, and we will be talking about Christmas things to a certain degree, possibly reindeers. We cannot confirm or deny this <laughs> right may, now. It may or may not include reindeers, flight, Santa, and a fiery death. <laughs> uh, and, a, uh, and a ho 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 just to throw in the mix oh, okay, week, cool. week, week 11 <laughs> we have should have uh, Professor Mark McDonald Pro, Doctor Doctor Mark, yes, doctor. Doctor, doctor Mark McDonald if they, if they teach you titles. in a big room in front of you they're a doctor okay so, okay, so Doctor Mark guide. McDonald <laughs> Doctor Mark McDonald who has already been referenced in this mm-hmm. episode uh, because he has a seven. theorem <laughs> or yes, a farm or one farm. of them or both he has both <laughs> And he hopefully has at least 12, one theory. Week twelve, which is the last, which is the last week we're going to tell you about. We have Doctor Benjamin Robinson from physics mm. coming on the show. Oh, and then after that point, we have many other mathematicians and physicists lined up possibly, to come on. Possibly even from other areas of the Faculty of Science and Technology. No one outside of that faculty, though. So far, <laughs> so if you are because outside. We don't know you. If you are outside of the Faculty of Science and Technology and we haven't got in touch with you and you are listening and have someone that you think should come on or you want to come on personally, please message us on either Facebook, YouTube, or uh, via the email, the at outlook.com.com. Um, so you can come on the show. Um, is the engineering department part of FST? I, I can't think, remember. I imagine it would be, wouldn't it? Uh, so I know some departments just have their own thing going, so. Yeah. Sorry, my co-host is currently in tears. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> are, you, are you good to continue though, Andrew? No, uh, no, he's not. <laughs> we'll give please oh, please give us, Too please give us a moment while Andrew recovers. Yep. <laughs> we will keep you updated. Yes, uh, hashtag pray for Andrew. <laughs> 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 so pray for I don't think I deserve someone praying for me after my laughing fit there Um, (laughs) anyway uh, so we're coming to the end of the show now and we'd like to thank you for tuning in again if you're a recurring guest or tuning in for the first time obviously we'll be uploading this to YouTube as we normally do into Mixcloud and we'll be posting all this on the Facebook page so please follow us at the Atomic Fridge on Facebook if you would like more information we're going to just end now with a song of Sean's choice. So, Sean, would you like to introduce the song we've chosen for? Well, the song you've chosen for us. All right. Um, it is the uh, the Cribs uh, doing uh, Come On, Be A No One. Um, thanks for having me. You're very welcome. You're very Thank welcome. you very much Thank for listening. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, <laughs> see you next week. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.